Hi all, 5.5 is the section covering trigonometric equations. It's what I feel is maybe one of the most important sections that we'll discuss this entire semester. Prob well, probably is the most important of the trigonometric sections. Uh, you'll see that the homework assignment is quite extensive for this section. And uh, even if you're doing the My Math Lab assignment, which uh, hopefully you are, uh, you can always compare against my homework uh, questions in the assignment. It took me quite a while to do the homework assignment uh, and several pages of, of, of work, but it was so much fun. And I think the problems are extremely important in this section. Uh, so whenever you run into anything on my math lab, remember there's a corresponding problem to my book homework assignment to it, where you can see me working out a very similar problem. Uh, now, also with the fact that this homework assignment is longer and I feel more important, I've made this assignment worth twice as much as the other assignments. Uh, so please, please make sure you don't skip this assignment. It would be like skipping two of the other assignments. It's worth twice the amount to the total on the My Math Lab grade. Uh, so what we're doing in here, obviously we're working equations. We're going to find all the solutions to a trigonometric equation. And that's actually pretty easy in and of itself. Uh, something that's more difficult is how do we solve equations with multiple angles? So what if instead of theta, you have two theta, three theta, four theta, five theta, 50 theta inside of your angle? Well, there's a certain way that we're going to handle that, and it's not too bad. Uh, solve trigonometric equations in quadratic and form. So quadratics don't just have to be x squared plus 3x plus 5. They could be uh, cosine squared x plus 3 cosine x plus 5. So we're going to have to know how to solve those out, and, and we've solved them the very same way that we would solve a normal quadratic, as long as the first term has uh, twice the power of whatever the trig function is, the middle term has it to the first power, and the third term is a constant. You can treat it just like a quadratic. It factors and solves the same way. Uh, the next thing here, we will be using factoring to separate different functions in, in trigonometric equations, using identities to solve trig equations. Uh, so uh, for some of these with multiple angles, if it's just a double angle, you might use some of your double angle identities to rewrite. So if I have the sine of 2 theta equals something, it might be easier to say 2 sine theta cosine theta is equal to, especially if there's a zero on the other side make it very easy to solve out. And then lastly, we'll use a calculator to solve some problems. Uh, so up first, if I try to think about equations involving a single trigonometric function, to solve an equation involving a single trigonometric function, we're going to isolate that function on one side of the equation, and then we solve for the variable. Pretty straightforward. Notice how that works in this problem. So I'm solving the equation. I have five times the sine of x is equal to three sine x plus the root of three. So clearly this is all in terms, the only trig function in here is the sine of x. So I isolate the sine of x by getting them the two terms on the same side, reducing it down. So now I know two sine x is equal to the root of three. Solve for the sine of x. I divide by two on each side. And now I have the sine of x is equal to the square root of three over two. Now, at that point, I should be thinking, well, the sine of x equals the square root of 3 over 2. That's when the y component on the unit circle is 0.866, pretty high up. I know that's in quadrant 1 and in quadrant 2. The two angles that that happens at is at pi over 3 and at 2 pi over 3. And if you have a very good working knowledge of the unit circle, you should be able to come up with that right off the top of your head. Now, if you need to draw the unit circle out and get it from that, that's fine. Uh, but now remember, a unit circle will never be provided on a test. You would have to draw it out and think about it uh, within each problem. So as soon as I tell you that the sine of x is the square root of 3 over 2, we're supposed to understand that the two components or the two angles on the unit circle at which the y is that value is your pi over 3 and 2 pi over 3. But now notice, this doesn't just say solve for one revolution from 0 to 2 pi. That would be my answers from 0 to 2 pi, but it's 
just solve the equation and it doesn't give me any domain restrictions. So I need to understand that pi over three and every single coterminal angle to pi over three is a solution. I can handle that by saying pi over three plus two n pi. n is understood to be an integer, which means you can rotate around two pi radians from that pi over three and keep on getting solution after solution after solution. And that's whether you rotate two pi over three positively or two pi over three negatively, uh, it's still going to give you a coterminal solution. So that's one way to write the general solution for the first answer. And then you see I've done the exact same thing for my second answer. I would just say, well, two pi over three is the location within the first revolution of the unit circle. In order to handle the general solution, I just say two pi over three plus two n pi. Sometimes you'll see two k pi. It's always either n or k that's used to represent an integer. Uh, we'll use n just because that's what our book chooses to use. Uh, now, example two here, solving an equation with a multiple angle. Okay, so for this one, I have to solve the tangent of 2x is equal to the root of 3, and I'm supposed to solve this for values between 0 and 2 pi. So here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, well, if x is between 0 and 2 pi, then 2x could be some value of x between 0 and 4 pi. So I'm going to be thinking of all solutions within two revolutions of the unit circle. So here's what I do. I'm thinking, all right, uh, I, need to, I need to be thinking, and uh, this is a misprint here. It's the tangent of 2x, not the tangent of pi over 3. I, I apologize. Oh, no, no, no. What I'm doing there is I'm saying, <laughs> sorry, uh, in quadrant 1 at an angle of pi over 3, we know at pi over 3, that the cosine value is one half and that the sine value is the square root of three over two. Well, the tangent of pi over three then is the square root of three over one or just the square root of three. So that's one value at that it occurs at. So then I can say, well, all right, then two X has to equal that pi over three. And then any coterminal angle to that, I could just say, well, all right, I know that uh, that the tangent would be the root of three again in quadrant three, and it would be at an angle of four pi over three, because at four pi over three, your sine is the negative square root of three over two, your cosine is negative one half, so the ratio of sine over cosine would be negative root of three over negative one. Hey, it's the positive root of three. So you'll see here, that's why I said your solutions are going to be are going to be at pi over three plus n times pi, because if you add one pi, it's going to take you to four pi over three. If you add another pi, it's going to take you uh, back up to seven pi over three, which is coterminal with pi over three. Add another pi, it takes you to the coterminal angle with four pi over three. In quadrant three, it'd be ten pi over three at that point. So I know my solutions are going to occur every n pi radians. I just need to set my angle 2x equal to that. Well, now when I solve for x, it's going to be pi over 6 plus n pi over 2. Now, this is where my general solution would be, but I just need to solve for values of x that are between 0 and 2 pi. So since I know that there's two solutions within the first rotation of the unit circle, I know that there's going to be a grand total of four solutions to this problem because this is going to allow me to go two revolutions. So I know that uh, these two are my first uh, solutions, pi over six and uh, my two pi over three. And then I, if I keep on going, I can say, well, my third and fourth solution, it's when I keep on having to add another value of n. Please notice here, I said my solutions are going to be at pi over 3 plus n pi. My first solution is when n is 0. I don't have to add anything to that first pi over 3. That is one solution. So it's just 2x is equal to pi over 3. And I get my solution, x equals pi over 6. Well, my second solution is when I had to add one value to that n. So you'd say, well, that's going to be pi over 3 plus pi. That's 4 pi over 3. So 2x equals 4 pi over 3. 
x is going to equal 4 pi over 6, which reduces down to your 2 pi over 3. Now, for my third and fourth solutions, please make sure you understand where they come from. It looks confusing when you see the n equals 0, n equals 1. That n value is just the number of times you had to add pi to get to each of these other angles. You had to add pi one time to get to this second angle. You're going to have to add it two times to get to the third angle and three times to get to the fourth angle. So whenever you're doing all of these, you can just say, well, we have our general formula, which is pi over six plus n pi over two. Might as well just use that for the first three values of n. That makes it easier. Yeah. So over here, I said, well, when n is two, I'm going to get pi over six plus two pi over two. That's adding pi. Pi over six plus pi gives me seven pi over six for my next answer. And please keep in mind, that answer is still an x value between zero and two pi. So you know, okay, keep going. Your next solution is gonna be when n is three. You'd say pi over six plus three pi over two. That's gonna give you pi over six plus nine pi over six, which is gonna give us 10 pi over six. And 10 pi over 6 would be 5 pi over 3. Now, let's assume you didn't know you should stop at an n value of 3. What if you think, well, okay, how do I know I don't keep on going? Well, try it. What if I did plug an n value of 4 in here? You would get pi over 6 plus 4 pi over 2. 4 pi over 2 is already 2 pi right there, so you'd be adding 2 pi and pi over 6. That would be an angle greater than 2 pi radians, which is not possible outside of the domain for x. So you'd know, eh, I, already, I already need to stop. Now, the way I would think about this, more so than, than doing that, is just to say, I know that there's two solutions within the first revolution of the unit circle. So for 2x, I'm going to be doubling that unit circle, and there will be two solutions in each of those revolutions. So I can say, ah, I already knew there would be four solutions, and there are. Uh, now, next problem here. What if you have a trigonometric equation in quadratic form? Uh, if it's in quadratic form in this manner, where you only have one of the trig functions uh, squared, it's best to go ahead and solve for that. Now we're going to see quadratic form where we have the second power and the first power later, and those are the ones that we're going to need to factor or use the quadratic formula. If you only have the trig term squared, it's the same thing as the example one where I say get the trig function all by itself. So you say, okay, my goal is to get cosine by itself. First step, I add three to both sides. I did that right here. And again, I'm thinking I need to find all solutions between zero and two pi. Up next, I would get the cosine squared by itself by dividing by four. And then if cosine squared X is equal to three fourths, then I can take the square root on both sides. And please, please remember, whenever you take the square root of both sides of an equation, the side not containing the variable you're solving for has to be the positive or negative root. So here we get the cosine of x is equal to the positive or negative square root of 3 fourths. And I can say, well, the square root of 3 doesn't simplify, uh, but the square root of 4 does. It's going to give me the positive negative square root of 3 over 2. And so now I just need to be thinking on a unit circle, when is the x component positive or negative square root of 3 over 2? Well, I know it's the positive square root of 3 over 2 at pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. It's the negative square root of 3 over 2 at 5 pi over 6 and 7 pi over 6. All four of those are solutions. And since we were only solving for values of x between 0 and 2 pi, those four solutions are our only solution. Now, if I hadn't given a domain restriction here, you could have easily found the general solution by just adding 2 n pi to each of these individual solutions, and you'd be done. Uh, for example, four here. So what if you have uh, multiple trig functions uh, within an equation? So in this one, well, I have two. I have sine x times the tangent x, and I'm saying that's going to be set equal to the sine of x. And I'm supposed to solve for x values between 0 and 2 pi. Again, the one revolution of the unit circle. 
So when I'm thinking about this, I, I, I know it's usually easier to set things equal to zero. So that's what I do. I bring the sine x over to the left-hand side. I do that and it's subtracted. Now, as soon as you do that, you're, you should be thinking, ooh, greatest common factor, the first and second term have a factor of sine x. So I'm going to factor that sine x out, and I'll be left with tangent x minus 1. This is gorgeous at this point because you know, hey, as soon as you get one factor times another is equal to 0, you can use the zero product property and solve this problem out. Your solutions are either going to be when the first factor sine x is equal to zero or when the second factor tangent x minus one is equal to zero. So sine x equals zero, that gives me solutions of zero and pi. My y value on the, on the unit circle is zero at those values. So I already know those, twos are, those two solutions are solutions. My other solution comes from when my other factor could equal zero. And it's the tangent of x is equal to 1. And when you think, well, when can the tangent x equal 1? That's at pi over 4 in quadrant 1 because your sine and cosine are both the square root of 2 over 2 there. And it's at 5 pi over 4 in quadrant 3 because both the sine and cosine are the negative square root of 2 over 2 there. So I can say, great, that means all four of these are solutions. Now, Quite often, I think on uh, my math lab, it'll force you to put the solutions in increasing order. So uh, if this were my math lab problem, I would need to put my final solution as uh, 0 pi over 4 pi and then 5 pi over 4. Those are my solutions from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, now, what if I have an expression where you have a multiple angle like a cosine of 2x but then you have another trig function in there. So I'm thinking, well, this is not going to be like the earlier problem where I just said, well, I'm going to think of two revolutions of my unit circle with that tangent of 2x problem. This one, I've got another trig function in there with it. So I'm confident I need to use one of my trig identities to get this all in terms of one trig function. So when I'm looking at the cosine of 2x plus sine x equals 0, one of our identities for the double angle of the cosine function, hopefully you remember it's cosine squared minus sine squared or, uh, a cosine, or 2 cosine squared x minus 1 or 1 minus 2 sine squared x. Those are the three identities for the cosine of 2x. Well, the identity that's helpful in this problem is the one that puts it all in terms of sine. So cosine of 2x is equal to 1 minus 2 sine squared x. And then I can say, well, I already had the plus sine x in there. Now, the reason that helps is because it's going to set it up in quadratic form. What I've done from this step to this step is I multiplied both sides by negative 1. Why would I do that? Well, because I saw even if I put it in descending order, my sine squared term would be negative. That's more difficult to factor. So I just said, well, I can easily multiply by negative 1 on both sides because 0 times negative 1 is still 0. When I multiply all of the terms on the left by negative 1 and right in descending order, you're going to have positive 2 sine squared x minus the sine of x minus 1. Now I can say, well, hey, this should be factorable. I have a squared term minus 1 times that term to the first, minus 1. You can think of this as x squared minus x minus 1 if you prefer. But then I can say, well, the only way I could ever get a 2 sine squared x is to take 2 sine x times sine x. And for that last term, we know the only factors of negative 1 are positive 1 and negative 1. It's just a question of where does the plus and minus go? Since the middle term has to be negative 1 sine x, the minus has to go over here. So now when you FOIL, you'll get 2 sine squared minus 2 sine x plus 1 sine x for a total of minus 1 sine x, and then the last term, negative 1. Once you have the left-hand side factored, you use the glorious zero product property to set each of these factors equal to 0. 2 sine x plus 1 is equal to 0 and sine x minus 1 is equal to 0. 
When this first factor equals zero, you can say, well, I need to isolate the trig function. No problem. Subtract one on each side. Two sine x is equal to negative one. We divide by two and you get the sine x is negative one half. Again, you need to be thinking in terms of unit circle. When is the y component negative one half? That's going to be an angle of five pi over six or I'm sorry, not five, at five pi over six, it's positive one half. At seven pi over six and 11 pi over six, uh, at those two values, the sine is negative one half. So I can say, okay, I know those are two of my solutions. What about my other solution? Well, it's when sine x, uh, um, sine x minus one is equal to zero. So sine x is equal to positive one. There's only one angle on the unit circle in which the y component is ever equal to positive one, and that's at pi over two. So uh, our three solutions uh, in increasing order, you could say, well, pi over two, seven pi over six, and 11 pi over six. Final answer for that one. Uh, for another one here, if I'm looking at solving trigonometric equations with a calculator, what I need you to remember here is that the calculator is only capable of ever giving you one answer. Most of our problems are going to have two answers. So when I look at something like uh, solving the equation, when does the tangent of x equal 3.1044? Okay, so when I reason in my head with this, I can say, all right, we know that the tangent function has to be restricted from negative pi over two to pi over two in order for the inverse tangent to exist. So the only answer my calculator could ever give me for the inverse tangent is an angle between negative pi over two and pi over two. So when I go in here and say, well, when is the tangent of x equal to 3.1044? So this is literally asking me, when does the y component go up 3.1044 times more than the x component moves to the right? Or when does the y component go down 3.1044 times more than the x component moves to the left? Now, our calculator can only give me that answer in quadrant one. It's not capable of giving me the answer in quadrant three. So you've got to understand, based on your knowledge of the unit circle, the existence of that other solution. So now you could say, well, the first solution, extremely easy. You just go to your calculator and say, x is going to equal the inverse tangent. The way you get rid of tangent is to take the inverse tangent of both sides. So x is equal to the inverse tangent of 3.1044. And then as a decimal, that's going to be approximately 1.2592 radians. So at 1.2592 radians, the y component is moving up 3.1044 times more than the x components moving to the right. But now you need to understand there is another value that your inverse tangent function cannot give you on your calculator. And so you can say, well, that value is always, always going to occur pi radians beyond that. Because you can say, well, at pi radians, you're going to be down in quadrant three and your y component's going to be going down 3.1044 times more than the x component's moving to the left. And you can go in and say, well, that's going to be at 4.4008 approximately. Now, if you had any question, you could calculate that out and say, oh, then I should be able to take the tangent of 4.4008 radians, and I better get back 3.1044, and yes, I promise you, you will. So you could easily check the other answer with the calculator, you just can't obtain it with the calculator. Uh, let's see, example seven. Using a calculator to solve trig equations again, uh, what if I give you a sine function? So this one should be very, very easy. Uh, whenever you think about the, the sine function, though, the inverse sine is, again, restricted from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. This time, the negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 are included, uh, but that still is only going to give you one answer. So this is asking us, when is the sine function negative 0.2315? That's literally asking me, when is the y component on the unit circle negative 0.23? Now, a problem 
two problems ago, we were asking when is the sine component negative one half? And we quickly said, well, that's at seven pi over six and 11 pi over six. So I am 100% certain, well, the sine function is negative 0.2315 for some angle between pi and seven pi over six and for some angle between 11 pi over six and uh, two pi, it has to be. So I know that the angle is closer to the x-axis, so it's greater than 11 pi over six, less than seven pi over six. Well, what is it? <coughs> Excuse me, my, my calculator will give me the answer in quadrant four. That's the only one it's capable of giving me. So when I go to the calculator and say, well, it's the inverse sine of uh, negative 0.2315 radians, it's going to give me x is approximately, and this should be uh, negative here, uh, it'll give me the negative 0.2336 radians. And I can say, well, all right, uh, in order to get that angle in quadrant three, I'm going to have to add that. Please, please understand, you can't subtract that from pi and stay in quadrant three. So you'd say, you take whatever the angular distance is to the nearest x-axis, you add it to pi radians to show you what the angle in quadrant three is. And then you can always test these. You could take the sine of 3.3752 radians, it will give you back the negative 0.2315. Now in quadrant four, you're going to say, well, it's two pi and then it should be, there's, there's a typo here, it should be two pi minus this uh, 0.2336, which, let's see, 2 pi minus 0.2336. My answer is correct there, the 6.0496. I'm just not sure why I have the typo uh, for the other part there. So please ignore that 1.2592. That's 0.2336 there. So you take 2 pi minus the 0.2336 to get this angle here. Now, uh, for any problems in this section, please let me know. Remember, I'm doing the uh, weekly help sessions. Be glad to help you with any of these problems. These are some fun problems. Make sure you check against my homework too if you need any help. Uh, but otherwise, uh, let, let me know if you need any help and I'll be glad to help in this section. Love this section, hope you will too.